The plots we create in our tabletop games revolve around conflict, challenges and goals. When we plan our campaign and sessions, we often think about those things. These are concepts that are too abstract to work with outright, so we need to proper tools to successfully implement them in our games. Factions are such a tool, and if we use them correctly, they can spark events, provide solutions and promote different agendas in our settings. In this video, we'll discuss factions and their benefits, we'll break down the qualities which makes them interesting, believable and helpful to you as a game master. Factions are entities that influence the setting. Like I mentioned in the previous video, I use the term a bit loosely. A single powerful being can be considered a faction in my definition. That would be the case for a powerful solitary lich, or an ancient primordial that slowly breaks out of her divine prison. We use factions when we create plots and adventures. In fact, you've been using them all along. The town's guard, village council, or dark overlord are all examples of factions. They help us define the status quo of the setting, but also provide us with reason to topple it. They can be used to create tension and alleviate it. Building factions is a lot like writing NPCs, because in a sense they are characters in the grand scheme of things. They have motivations, goals and their own personality. Their backstory formed alliances and enmities with other factions. Of course, building factions is also different from building characters, because a faction is often made of many distinct individuals so we'll need to make sure we don't miss that. In the Fate systems, there is a term called Faces. A face is a character that embodies or represents an element of the setting. For example, when you think about the Lazy Dragon Inn, a small comfortable place for your adventurers to rest after a long journey through the wildlands, you think about Jonah, the half-elven barkeep and the proprietor of the inn. Jonah is the face of that location. Factions have faces too, and just like with locations, they are characters that embody or represent the faction. The obvious choice for a face would be the leader or the most influential member of the faction. This intuition is good because the goals of the leader will almost certainly align with the goals of the faction they are leading, making it a good choice for a representative. Sometimes we'll want to pick another member as a face, perhaps someone that our adventurers are more likely to contact. If we build a city watch for our capital, we don't have to think about the commander as its face. We could take a low-ranking officer instead. Let's call her Lieutenant Rivers. Rivers is a figure of authority that the party is more likely to meet early on. She'll be out in the streets when things go wrong, followed by a small troop. Rivers will also pay the rewards for requests found on the notice board just outside the barracks. We can take it even further, choosing a member whose goals do not align with the rest of the faction. Say we have a corrupt government in our city. For a face, we'll pick the character with the concept of last honest politician. See what we did here? By making him contradict the government, we define it. If we need to pull a government official out of our hats, we know they are inevitably more corrupt than this guy. When we build a faction, we should aim for a small amount of faces. One is usually the number I start with, but sometimes one is not enough. Clay, or as some of you may know him, the DM behind the screen, said that there is nothing more boring than a unified evil front, and I tend to agree. Large factions should feel less monolithic. To achieve that, we can create factions with a bunch of faces rather than just one, giving each of them different goals and ideals that still somewhat align with the faction they're in. Another method suggested by Clay is to create a few smaller factions within a vacuum, and combine them together to create larger factions. Essentially, they enter into alliances to achieve common goals, yet you'll find disparity in their motivations and true agendas. Inner conflicts give the players an opportunity to play their enemies against one another, which always makes for a good role-playing experience at the table. Just like characters that roll for stats, not all factions are made equal. A small mercenary band is on a different scale from a kingdom, Chances are the kingdom would even notice the existence of the band, and even if the mercenaries pull all of their resources together, they won't be able to hold back the king's army. The magnitude of the factions plays a big part, but some factions can be very powerful with a relatively small size. Think about the Cabal of Wizards, for example. Even 12 mages are a force to be reckoned with, especially if you consider the Archmage that leads them. Given time to prepare, they could take down an army a hundred times their size. 
The resources a faction has at their disposal also plays a big part in determining their overall influence. A rich organization can hire other factions to work them, thus nullifying other weaknesses they might have on their own. We should consider the magnitude, power and resources when we create a faction to determine its overall influence and define the area in which it exists. The kingdom's pool is very apparent in the capital where the throne is, but becomes less and less so the further you travel from the crowded cities, until finally it vanishes. In the places where it's weak, there will be more factions willing to openly challenge it. Where areas of influence overlap, there is a ground for conflict, competition or cooperation between factions. And these are great catalysts for plot development. To determine how they interact with each other, we'll need to take a look at their motivations and goals. The motivations of our factions should be simple one-line statements. It's okay if they feel obvious, because we won't have to read them out to the players. A thieves guild could have gather respect and coin as their motivation. Taking that into account, we can plan the goals for the faction, more concrete things that they wish to achieve. If they want gold, the heavily secured bank of the city is a good place to look, so we can set that as a goal. Now, how can we use that in our game? Well, there's a reason they didn't rob the bank already, it's not easy. They need intel, capable thieves, and a good plan to surpass all the threat that this endeavor will certainly rouse. So here are a few plot hooks that we can come up with. The guild is on the lookout for capable people and are willing to pay good coin. A guild agent could meet the party and hire them for a small task to test their abilities. If they are successful, the agent will take them to meet the rest of the guild. Walking in the streets at night, the party stumbles into a chase. Armed guards run after a quick figure clad in dark blue robes. As he runs towards them, he throws a small pouch of coin and says, Distract them and there's more. Plot hooks can also come from the enemies of the guild. Any faction with an opposing agenda can provide a plot hook that might foil their plans. Speaking of opposing agendas, it's time to figure out who likes or hates the faction we just made up. Factions that existed for a while influence their surrounding, including other factions that may or may not enjoy it. So it makes sense to map the relationship between them to represent the fact that they've been doing this for a while. In the adventure building video, we made an example of a relationship graph based on events that transpired in the past. It's fairly obvious why a thieves guild and the city watch are enemies, but if the corrupt government secretly supports the guild, it makes things a bit more interesting and definitely noteworthy. When we prep a city, we don't write the backstory of every possible NPC the players might write into. The same is true for factions. Not every organization is a faction in our setting. Not because they aren't important or have no influence, but simply because they aren't connected to the focus of our story. Later on in the campaign, we might decide to create more factions and deem they were always around, or remove factions that lose relevance to the story. That's fine, you have that power as a GM. Use it to your advantage. Start a game with a few factions and add more as the campaign progresses, depending on the player's choices and the NPCs they choose to interact with. Whenever the players interact with a faction, I develop it a little more. The Azure Vale is a mage guild that specializes in the creation of magical items. The party ran into a store before, and were super excited to find another one in the capital, with a small crew of NPCs that they can talk with. Whenever they returned to the Azure Vale, I took note of it and added something small for the next time they visited. An NPC here, a magic item there, another room, and so on. Recently, the Azure Vale stopped taking commissions because the king hired them to create magic items for an underground expedition he's planning. These small changes help us build a world that feels alive. So when the players finish a story arc that involves one or more factions, take a moment and think about how it affected them. What goals did they achieve or fail? What powers or resources they gained or lost? Write new goals and add faces if you feel like they are needed. To help track all those changes, I made a faction sheet that you can use in your campaign. It's system agnostic, so you can use it whether you run D&D, Fate, or any other tabletop system. Heck, it could even be useful for writers out there. Remember, we plan to improvise, so having a few familiar factions at the ready gives us the anchor we need to work around. If you weren't disintegrated by a beholder right now, you heard me babble about factions, how to create them, and how we can use them in our games. 
We've talked about faces that embody or represent a faction and how to use multiple faces to create a less monolithic organization. We went over some qualities like magnitude, power and resources of factions, as well as their area of influence. We've covered the factions' motivations and goals and how to use them to create plot hooks in our campaigns, as well as create competition, conflict and cooperation between different factions. Finally, we talked about the dynamic aspect of factions and how they can change over time to create the feeling of a living world. You can track all of those things in the faction sheet that I will link in the description. I'd like to hear you guys in the comments, so tell me about the faction you've created for your own setting. Thank you for tuning in for another episode of Toll of the Trade. I'm Avia Tal, and if you like this video and want to see more of me in the future, subscribe! If you want to talk with me, you can join the community's Discord. It's slowly gaining an audience, and if you survived this far in the video, we want you on board with us. Until next time, you are awesome, keep being awesome, and I'll see you beyond the screen.